All right, we've got about 100 folks here so far. Thanks for your patience and working through some of those technical difficulties. Um, excited to have you all here. And today we're going to be talking about um, we're going to be talking about uh, a full circle approach to soil health and what that looks like. And we've linked up here and partnered with Lance at Region Ag Labs, and we're going to be running through. Um, introducing biomakers and introducing region ag labs and talking about how we're working together and how we are bringing a full circle approach to soil testing and evaluating soil health. So we'll go ahead and get things kicked off here. Just some uh, housekeeping items before we jump in. We have got, uh, you can drop questions into the chat box and we'll loop back around those at the end. We did leave plenty of time for questions to dive in with you all to talk about um, different, you know, any questions that you have related to soil health and soil health testing. So we'll have plenty of time for questions. So please just drop questions in the chat box as they come up for you and we'll circle back on those. And I think that that's all. If there's anything else, um, please co-host chime in, but we'll go ahead and get started. And uh, we're gonna kick off here just by introducing the two companies, Biomakers and Region Ag Labs. So, for those of you who haven't met Biomakers yet, we are a ag tech company based out of California. Uh, we have a lab, new lab just opened in Davis. And we are a company that's looking at the DNA of soil biology and decoding it and translating it, translating it into functional information to be used in the agricultural industry. So we're looking at uh, all of the different fungi and bacteria and microbes and identifying their function and translating it into a functional assessment of what those microbes are doing, how they're moving and grooving in the soil, and how that contributes to various management practices and fertility decisions. So that's a little bit about biomakers. Um, we collaborate mostly with ag input manufacturers, growers, and retailers. Lance, I'll, I'll let you introduce Region Ag Labs. unmute myself first sorry takes me a minute um uh, so yeah thank you marie um region ag lab uh was founded in 2019 uh, with a primary focus of working with growers uh all over the world uh focused on regenerative agriculture so my background is in soil biology and that's what we focus mostly on with tests such as the haney test and plfa and now bringing in the bee crop technology and uh, working with biomakers for the last couple of years uh, doing side-by-side -side comparisons and things like that and really excited about how these things tie together which is the point of this webinar today to talk about how those two technologies uh, can be used and and beyond the any test as well with some of the other things that we'll talk about but um, yeah and I apologize in advance it might be a little noisy around here uh, we've got some construction projects going on, so I'm just going to throw that out really quick. <laughs> Hopefully, yeah, no the power doesn't go out. An exciting expansion you have going on. Yes. Do you want to talk about that at all? Um, yeah, I, I haven't really publicly announced oh. it. I've said it to a few people. So, uh, yeah, we are undergoing an expansion uh, currently. We just broke ground on that here two or three days ago. Uh, our current facility that we built in 2020 was 9,600 square feet, and we are currently adding on an additional 13,000 square feet. So uh, more than doubling in size. Um, hope to, I say hope because that's all we've got anymore when it comes to construction, but we hope that we're going to be in the building and operational uh, in October of this year. And... Uh, We've got it set up, fingers crossed, that we don't actually have to shut down any of our operations. Uh, the way this is going to be done, there shouldn't be a disruption of any kind. So very excited about that. It's been a long time coming, even though we've only been around for three years. We started the process about 16 months ago and finally broke ground. So uh, here we go. Let's see what happens. Well, that, that's really exciting. And sorry if I bursted the, the announcement bubble on yep. that. <laughs> My apologies. It's it's officially happening now. So I, I I see it outside of my window. They're hauling hauling dirt in and and getting ready. So I I think I can talk about it a little more openly now that it's actually happening. So 
that kind of started. Well, I think that that's really exciting. And I think it's just a testament to the importance of this conversation, right? Why, you know, you opened with the foundation of like running the handy test and and folk at being a lab that specializes in soil health and you've had the demand enough from the get-go as soon as you opened your doors to start thinking about an expansion within a year and a half of having your doors open so that's really exciting and i think it's just uh highlights the importance of this conversation and and the the energy the energy that's going into the soil health conversation in general so super exciting uh, excited to see the new lab when it when it opens up later this year yeah so I mean, just just kind of segueing here, I think I wanted to just pause a little bit and have some story time around like why biomakers and region ag labs have partnered in the first place, because I think like talking about our alignment and our mission and why we've really partnered. And, and you know, as some of you know, we've region ag labs and biomakers have been partnered for the last year and a half or two. And because we have alignment around our soil health goals, and now it's just really exciting that Lance is going to be uh, helping us expand our um, capacity, our sampling capacity by having the technology in his lab. And we're super excited about that. So I just wanted to kind of leave some space for us to talk about why we've partnered. And I'm happy to share like my excitement around the collaboration between biomakers and region ag labs, because the, um, the way that, you know, soil health testing has evolved biomakers is really like the next evolution of that and so it totally makes sense that there's a lot of alignment there and i don't know lance if there's anything you want to say about the the partnership in general um i just wanted to kind of leave some space for us to share some about like why we've partnered and what's so exciting about that yeah um you know the big thing the big thing for us is that we I've had my eye on genomics testing for about 10 years and, you know, we were kind of waiting up uh, me personally, I was kind of waiting for the technology to further develop and really kind of come out full circle. And yes, we still, I mean, we always have more to learn and more to do, but I felt like we kind of hit a tipping point. And when I was introduced to the B crop technology, um, I really, I, I was intrigued by the technology, uh, it gave us insight into things that we haven't really measured before um, when it comes to soil and things that we couldn't measure currently with our list of services. Um, as we kind of learned more about it, it, it started to become pretty evident that we were bridging gaps. We were, you know, we were bringing more puzzle pieces in to build the puzzle. And I really found the value not necessarily with B crop as a standalone technology, any more so than soil carbon is a standalone measurement, you know, but with, we're talking about the integration of the system and the holistic view of the system, the idea that, hey, this is a piece here that we haven't seen before. And we started to really dive into tying together things. And that's really what kind of formed the foundation of this partnership is that, you know, we've got services that we feel help producers b crop obviously in biomakers feels that their services help producers now is there a compounding effect you know if we bring these two things together are we just doubling or or, or is it an exponential and so far i've seen exponential um by bringing those pieces of information together yeah i well, i completely agree i to echo that sentiment i think you know when we look at the soil it's you know hip, Historically, we've really compartmentalized and looked at the chemical and, and to some extent the physical traits of the soil. And with Regen, you guys doing an incredible job getting these new new forms of soil health focused testing, the Haney test, enzymes, PLFA out there. And then to integrate another tool in the toolbox with our, our B crop test really helps broaden the, the story and the and the puzzle of what we're able to put together with a, a grower's field, you know, understand it. And we'll talk in more depth about this later in the in the presentation, but being able to see, you know, the the pools of plant available and microbe available nutrients, the organic and inorganic pools, and then see the level levels of the microbes that drive those changes between those different pools of nutrients. We've seen some really powerful results combining the Haney test with with uh, the B crop. Yeah, it's I, and and to speak on like the the piece of you know one or the other not being like standalone, like 
they can, they give you some good insights, but when you really put like the chemical fertility and the soil respiration and all the biological functional indexes, it really is the bridging of the gap for the missing puzzle piece to look at soil more holistically. And we'll, we'll again, we'll get into this um, here shortly, but really, you know, capturing the the chemistry in the soil and understanding that from a from a biological level, which the Haney test does really well, and then understanding how the chemistry is actually moving by looking at the biology. So we'll dive into more of that, but um, just wanted to touch on yeah, like what what uh, the the purpose behind the partnership and why we're so excited to work together. So thanks for that insight and sharing, Lance. I think that makes a ton of sense, and we're really excited. And I think like part of the root cause of that and and maybe for us at Biomakers anyways, is we, we are here to address the global challenges that face agriculture right now between increased fertilizer costs and input costs and the you know increasingly um, challenging conditions, whether that's you know more extreme heat, more extreme cold, uh, wind, rain, precipitation, drought, all of these things are becoming more extreme are leading to various crop loss and quality decline and soil health can make us resilient to that and focusing on soil biology can make us more resilient to that and balancing and understanding how the chemistry and biology are working together is what is going to ultimately help us you know manage input costs and and manage crop loss and quality uh in changing conditions and in, in the um you know geopolitical climate as well with fertilizer and input costs so, you know, soil health, focusing on soil health, soil biology, we, I, we really believe is one of those primary solutions to optimizing your agricultural inputs on farm um, and also improving and sustaining yield, you know, sustainable from the, the essence of what the word sustain means, which is to continue at this level in, in perpetuity, right? So we want to improve and, and sustain yields from where we are today. So just really quickly to, to run through the agenda and what we're going to be covering today, some things we've already talked about, but the soil health challenges and the concept of, of soil health and its importance and how chemistry and biology are working together to create that. Uh, we're going to talk about the different soil health testing that's out there, uh, diving deeply into bee crop and Haney and how they're working together, how they're you know supporting growers and input manufacturers and understanding soil as an ecosystem that it is and understanding how we can work with it uh, more efficiently to, for, to optimize you know, our input performance and operations on farm. Um, and then what we talked about the partnership a little bit. We have a few questions in specific that we want to address and then we'll open it up for Q&A following that. So, so far we've talked quite a, quite a bit about just Soil health. What is soil health? How is it defined? Why should we care about it? And and what is it really? What is it? What is it? How do we look at it? So the NRCS uh, defines soil health as to con the continued capacity for soil to function as a vital living ecosystem that sustains plants, animals, and humans. So within that, soil is a living ecosystem. It has microorganisms. It has insects. It has all of these dynamic things that contribute to soil health overall, as well as the chemical aspects of soil. So your pH, the minerals, nutrient availability, cation exchange capacity, the structure of the soil. So the physical aspects, um, aggregation, water infiltration. And then we have the biological components, which the biology is moving a lot of the chemistry in the soil. And the, the biology is also influencing water infiltration and aggregation. And it, it all ties together. Everything is interconnected. So biology isn't doing everything, but the physics and biology of the soil are deeply connected and the chemistry and the biology of the soil are deeply connected. So we can't, for a really long time, like Gus and, and Lance alluded to, we've looked at soil from just this chemical lens or for, just from the physical lens, but without looking at it more holistically and addressing the biology, the chemistry and the physics of the soil, we're, we're, there's gaps, right? There's gaps in how we're understanding the functionality of the soil. Uh, and there's gaps in deeply being able to optimize uh, soil and soil health for um, 
you know, to address some of those issues that we talked about in terms of input costs and um, production efficiencies. So it, it's really important. And like Lance mentioned, um, you know, genomics has been around for a while. It's largely been used in the medical industry. And now we're adopting those same technologies in agriculture to get a deeper look and, and bring, I think about it like the, it's stuff that we've known for a really long time, that the soil is living, but we haven't had the data to really understand what it does. And with genomics, that's what we're we're getting to. That's what we're doing, right? Is is understanding what the soil biology does. So now we we can give it more purpose, right? Now we can care about it more and we can understand it better having this data to better inform our, our agricultural decisions. So that that's what really excites me uh, about you know, metagenomics, soil genomic testing is just putting, providing the data to the things we've known so that we can more deeply understand it and use that data to inform our management decisions. So we've kind of talked to like the different types of soil testing, right? That have addressed all of these different issues over time. Um, you know, the chemical fertility and all of its different extraction forms, there's, you know, a long timeline of history around that dating back to the early to mid 1900s when we started looking at the chemistry of the soil with different extraction methods and, and trying to understand what is going on from a chemical level. Um, and so today, you know, we have things like malic 3 we look at total, total nutrient digest digestion if we're looking at like the geological potential of the soil. And then you know, the most revolutionary in chemical fertility so far has been the Haney test, which has been adopted by the USDA and NRCS. Um, and we'll dive into exactly what that entails and how it's different from the MALIC-3 here as we go. Um, from a physical standpoint, we're looking at soil texture, bulk, bulk density, water holding capacity, or water infiltration. And, and these things are all important understanding, um, you know, the physical structure of the soil. And then we have the biological component of the soil, which we've looked at either, you know, soil respiration, which is included in the Haney test, and then, you know, the PLFA, which I helps us identify big picture what um, functional groups are present in the soil, but doesn't really tell us all of the functionality and the different jobs that are going on in the soil. And that's where genomics has really uh, leveled up the soil testing world to be able to look at the functional aspects on a deeper level with the B-crop test. So obviously this doesn't capture all of the chemical, physical, and biological types of analysis, but these are kind of the, the main ones in the market today and kind of helps us understand the evolution of chemical, biological, and physical testing and where we've landed today talking about the Haney test and the B-crop test as being the, um, you know, the, the next generation of soil testing and uh, how that's going to support operations on farm and management decisions. So again, we talked about this a little bit too, but the goals of soil health testing with B-crop plus, so that's what we call the Haney test plus the B-crop test, where you're combining the um, latest and greatest chemical fertility analysis with the latest and greatest biological functionality assessments in agriculture today. When we put those together, we call it B-Crop Plus. And what that's helping us do is evaluating the needs of both the crop and the soil microbes. Uh, the biology of the soil and the plant health are intimately, deeply related together. And so if we understand the soil microbiome, just like we're starting to understand the gut microbiome in humans, it is directly related to plant health and efficiencies, right? Uh, we are also identifying areas of soil nutrient and microbial deficiencies. So by looking you know, at the Haney test, we're identifying plant available nutrients and microbe available nutrients. And then with the B-crop test, we're looking at microbial potential, uh, the potential to move those nutrients, the, um, the different hormone production and stress adaptation functions that are happening in the soil biology. We can identify deficiencies or strengths there to better inform our management decisions with both chemistry and biology in mind. And, and we're using that really to determine how to maximize nutrient use efficiencies and other things on farm. So if we understand how much 
how much uh, nutrition we have available, potentially available in the soil, which we'll touch on here shortly. And then we understand the biology that is actually there to move and make the chemistry available. That contributes directly to nutrient use efficiencies and that trickles down into yield and input costs and so on. And overall, we're using the B-Crop test, B-Crop Plus test to help monitor management practices for continuous improvement. So this year, you, you run your B-Crop Plus and you get an idea of your potentially available nutrients and your baseline biological function. Now you can identify you know, every year, just like you do your chemical fertility, where you're at in terms of nutrient availability, but with the biological addition to this, we can really help identify uh, continuous improvement in the soil biology, biodiversity, uh, functionality of the soil ecosystem beyond just available nutrients. So it's it really tracking progress. I was going to say basically taking the guessing game out of your improvement, you know, getting basically a report card back rather than having to rely on indicators like yield, which of course at the end of the day are incredibly important, but are not always able to give you a, a pinpoint picture of whether your practices and inputs are, are improving soil health and, and uh, bolstering the microbiome. So the Haney and B-Crop to combine a great monitoring tool to be able to take the guessing game out and be certain that your investments and, and management practices are, are pushing the needle in the right direction. Yeah, and even from the um, taking the guesswork out too of like what products or management practices to use in season, right? If you have, if you're having crop loss or yield drags or pathogen issues and you haven't, you know, every year you try something new, but you still haven't identified the problem, we work with so many growers and agronomists that you know the bee crop test with in conjunction with the uh, fertility answers now we have the full picture and we answer the questions and can make those decisions in season so we're not continuing to spend years at guessing uh, what is actually going on so biology has often been a missing link so kind of want to dive here into the bee crop test and then i'll hand it over to lance to talk about the haney test and how it's different from uh traditional chemical fertility and then we'll tie it all together and, and leave a lot of time a lot of time here for questions so again what the bee crop test is doing is you know we're creating a standard for soil biology analysis and decoding soil soil health so we're you know going from a soil sample, just like you do for your chemical fertility, we're using an extraction, but instead of extracting chemistry, we're extracting biological DNA. We take that DNA and we look at the genes of all of the different organisms, and we have uh, the largest database in the world of soil organisms that continues to grow as we collect more soil. We have over 14 million microbes identified to date, and we look at the genes and what functions they're associated with, and we create functional reports in a very concise, uh, you know, digestible way that, you know, I don't know a lot of people that can look at a list of hundreds of microbes and tell you what's really going on. So that's kind of where we come in and create functional reports from that taxonomic list of organisms that are in the soil to let you know, relative to all cornfields, your uh, potential to mobilize nitrogen is really low. So that means your nutrient use efficiencies are struggling and there's an opportunity now to identify why you have low nutrient use efficiencies because you have low nitrogen mobilization pathways in the soil and make a decision based on that to improve nitrogen cycling in through nurturing soil biology, bringing in a new biological product to help inoculate uh, and bring in those microbes. And so that's our functional reports are designed to help make those management decisions. So some of the data that's provided in the bee crop test, as I've touched on a little bit, uh, we have like overall soil quality indexes. So we're looking at biodiversity. We have an overall functionality metrics. We're looking at resilience. Resilience, I feel like I think about a lot. In, in agriculture today, resilience can just set you ahead of your neighbors. If you're really resilient and you have robust soil health, um, you're going to be as the word describes, like resilient to the in changes and big fluctuations in environmental factors that we can't control. 
Uh, we look at the fungal bacterial ratio, which is just a, an indicator, a metric around soil health, and then mycorrhizal ratio, so a buscular to ectomycorrhizae uh, fungi that we're looking at. And then we really get into like plant health and nutrient cycling. This is where the, the bread and butter really is in my mind for a grower, right? We are identifying soil-borne diseases, but from a, from a risk evaluation standpoint, so by looking at natural biocontrol agents or beneficial organisms in the soil, we can give a more holistic look at pathogen pressure beyond just identifying if the pathogen is there. Um, we also look at phytohormone producers and abiotic stress tolerance. So, you know, between pathogens, hormone production, and abiotic stress tolerance, you know, those are all key contributors to plant health and vigor that the biology is directly supporting. So we need those to be robust and functioning for us in order to have a healthy plant immune system that's resilient. And then of course we need nutrients. All of those things also contribute to plant health. Uh, if we don't have our proper protein, carbohydrates, and fats, we don't have a healthy person. Those are our basic building blocks and the biology in our gut makes those things available. So your nitrogen, potassium, and um, phosphorus nutrient cycling by the microbes in the soil are critical too, are the key component, I would say. Uh, Gus or Lance challenged me here if I'm wrong, but one of the key components of that nutrient cycling and having nutrient use efficiencies is having robust biology that can help move those nutrients and make them available to the plant. We also look at carbon cycling and then your micronutrient pathways and organic matter breakdown. So uh, your, your zinc mobilization is critical for immune system, a plant immune health and, and resilience. Uh, we look at calcium, or calcium, magnesium, manganese, and so on, your other primary micros that are critical in producing vitamins and hormones in the plant. So those, the, all of those nutrient building blocks and the pathways for mobilizing those in the soil we look at in the biology as well. One thing I think is worth just quickly touching on here is that a lot of growers are familiar with the, the situation where they pull up fertility, you know, a conventional fertility test and they see they have plenty of nutrients there in their soil. Then they're pulling tissue analysis throughout the season and seeing, you know, tissue deficiencies. And a lot of times, I mean, there's a lot of factors that can affect plant assimilation uptake of nutrients, but many times it's the biology that is lacking the biology that can drive those those nutrients into the plant's available forms and and promote plant uptake, um, and as well as looking at the Haney test of being able to look at both some you know microbe available nutrient pools in the organic forms as well as the inorganic pools available to the plant, we can get a broader picture and sometimes piece together very clearly where that bottleneck is occurring to to nutrient uptake because it's not always cut and dry based on a conventional fertility test and I think. Many folks are, are finding our tests useful for that reason that we can uncover and, and put together the pieces of the broader puzzle. Yeah, and, and relative to nutrient and crop quality, right? I mean, this is a very hopeful message for me and probably one of the most exciting things <laughs> about working at Biomakers and having worked in agriculture for almost a decade is that, you know, any, any crop quality or nutrient deficiency, deficiencies in the crop it's really easy to point to the fertility and point to the available nutrients in the soil. But, but catch the word available. The nutrients are, are oftentimes, more often than not, there, but the biology is not there to move it, which is exciting. And the hopeful message for me is that the biology is very resilient. The biology will bounce back. We can inoculate with new biology. We can support and nurture the soil biology to bring back those functions and mobilize the nutrients that we already have in the soil that's just not available yet because the biology is not there. But what's exciting about that is that in many cases, we don't need to be hauling nutrients all over uh, from all over the place. Sometimes we just need to get the biology working for us and bring in the nutrients that we do need. Um, and, and just get it get it cycling again. So that that just excites me. The biology is very resilient. It will you know if we if we identify where we are today and just nurture that, it will bounce back for us and start working for us again. So, Lance, I can run through this, or happy to pass it over and have you run through the the Haney test and what it uh, what it does and how it's different from other chemical fertility analysis. Uh, yeah, I'm more than happy to chime in. Um, so the, the Haney soil test 
is kind of a combination approach. Uh, so there are, as I was kind of pointing out earlier, there's biological indicators, and then there's also the chemical, you know, the, the nutrient side, the fertility side. Um, what really sets any test apart for the most part is we're starting to look at nutrient pools that are not traditionally measured. So most soil tests are gonna focus, you know, when we talk about nitrogen, we're gonna focus on nitrate um, as, as the nutrient availability to your crop, right? But nitrogen exists in the soil in hundreds of different compounds and plants, you know, if you're anything other than a plant, you don't really eat nitrate um, and ammonium. You're eating protein. And the protein, of course, is the product of those plants. You know, they take in nitrate and ammonium and make protein using sunlight energy photosynthesis. So the Haney test is saying, well, let's start looking at the biological side of this process. Because in agriculture, everything works in a cycle. And for agriculture, it's, you know, let's dump, let's dump nutrients on the soil put them into a plant, make protein, and then haul the protein off and sell that as your commodity. Nothing wrong with that, except when we started looking at these efficiencies on the back end of, well, how much do you have to put in to get out what you want? And it's not a very efficient system. So it's not about necessarily eliminating that input, but how can we finance the gap. That's always my big analogy. Fertilizer is gap insurance. You have a goal, you're growing corn, you want 300 bushel corn, how much nitrogen do you need? How much phosphorus do you need? Okay, that's pretty, pretty set up. We know what the plant requires. And then we say, okay, how much is in the soil? Okay, and then what's the gap? And if this is your gap, then we're going to buy the insurance, which is the fertilizer. Nothing wrong with that, except Fertilizer is not free. And it's, you know, so you want to finance the, the smallest gap you need to. Um, I don't know if anybody's borrowed any money from the banks recently, um, if there's any banks even lending money anymore, but uh, eight and a half percent interest, nine percent interest. Um, you don't want to borrow more than you need. So the Haney test is trying to say, okay, let's look at nitrate, let's look at ammonium, let's look at phosphate, that's fine. But let's look at these organic pools that are that are soluble, they're in soil solution. This is what the microbes have access to. And microbes tie up nitrate when they're not happy. Um, if the soil's anaerobic, they use nitrate in their metabolism. We all know that as denitrification, uh, the reduction of nitrate back to nitrous oxide, and so on and so forth. But generally, they're eating protein tied to carbon. And that is measured on the Haney test as soil respiration. So most microorganisms follow the same aerobic metabolism that we do. Um, we consume carbon and protein. We generate waste products, nitrogenous waste products, urine, feces. Microbes do the same thing. Cattle do the same thing. And then that becomes what? fertilizer for the crop. So what we're trying to evaluate with the Haney test is this process taking place in the soil. So as you feed the organisms more, they do what most organisms do, they replicate. And you build a larger workforce. If you have a pasture that supports 20 cattle and you are able to make the pasture healthier and it now supports 40 cattle, you generate more cycling right? Plants being consumed, etc. So the respiration on the Haney test is aimed at measuring that process. We use a water extraction. Um, I often get asked, you know, your laboratory, why don't you use something really fancy? Where's all the beakers and the chemistry, you know? And it's like, but it rains water, right? And I know that sounds really simple, but I actually had to ask Rick Haney that question. Um, you know, why water, Rick? And he said, well, it rains water. We irrigate with water, right? Now that water mixes with soil. And it's the same scenario here. We take dried and ground soil, we add water to it, 
And that water then carries certain things or solubilizes certain things that are in the soil. One of those is carbon. And so we're measuring this water extractable carbon and nitrogen, and that's what the microbes have access to. There's a lot of discussion about carbon and, you know, well, what's active and what's labile? They use all these terms, you know, labile active carbon, what's sequestered carbon and all this different stuff. Well, at the end of the day, I can use any set of chemistry you want to pull carbon out of the soil. That doesn't necessarily mean the microbes have that same chemistry. It doesn't mean the plants are introducing that chemistry. Um, so we say, you know, hey, yeah, it's active. Look at that. We pulled it out. But in reality, the water mixed with soil solution is going to give us our best look at that. The other extraction on the Haney test is H3A. Uh, the H3A extraction is there to mimic soil solution when you have plant root exudates coming into that soil ecosystem. Plants generate carbon compounds that are leaked into the soil for two reasons. That is how they pay the workforce, the microorganisms. I told you microbes want carbon. They have to eat just like we do. The plants are willing to trade some of that carbon so these microbes can use that energy to solubilize and mobilize nutrients that it they then feed to the crop. Why are they feeding those nutrients to the crop? Well, because that's their food source. It's the same reason we feed nutrients to crops. So the microbes feed the nutrients to the crops to build a healthier, bigger plant. A healthier, bigger plant captures more carbon. You see this positive feedback loop happening, right? They give more carbon and so on and so forth. The H3A extraction mimics that process. It's it's root exudates mixed with soil to then evaluate the plant nutrients. And often, go ahead, Marie. No, no, go ahead. I would say, you know, often I'm asked this question then is to, you know, or I'm or this was pointed out, say, well, yeah, but, you know, the H3A isn't calibrated or correlated to Malik 3 or Olsen or ammonia mastate. Well, that's a good thing, uh, in all honesty. Um, if it, if it gave us the exact same numbers as Malik 3, then why in the world are, you know, why are we having this conversation? Uh, Malik 3 just works, and that would be what we do. But I think there's there's plenty of arguments saying that it, it doesn't always work, you know. Um, and in some situations where it does, it's generally because the biology of that soil is so drastically reduced and degraded that the soil operates as a chemistry set. If the soil is operating as a chemistry set, those traditional or conventional extracts do pretty well. Um, they're not efficient. We don't have great use efficiency, right, from the nutrients, but we can generate yields and do all that. As we transition the operation and it becomes driven more biologically rather than chemically, those chemical extracts don't tell us really what's happening we need to change the tool in the toolbox and that's really the big difference between the two yeah and if i can just hop in here really quick and so the the one thing that i'm hearing from this is that like the haney test is using a a an, ex, an extraction method that more closely mimics the soil conditions both the natural rainwater and the soil biology and it's the organic gases that they produce too mobilize and use and, and eat and consume nutrients right yeah. so and the interesting thing about all of all of the chemical fertility and the haney test being you know the the next the latest and greatest is that it, it's still looking at potentially available nutrients based on and it's potentially available only if you have the biology actually in the soil to make that happen and that's one of the reasons you look at soil respiration as well but that kind of leads us into like the, so we, we kind of talked about this, all the different things that the Haney tests are, are looking at, but it leads us into how the Haney test and the bee crop test can really give you the full circle approach and, and, and look at what's going on because the Haney test is looking at potentially available nutrients in an ecosystem with biology. And then the bee crop test is looking at the biology that's actually there to move the nutrients. 
And like you said, Lance, like having it as a standalone, one doesn't tell you what nutrients are available and one doesn't tell you like what the function of the biology is to actually move specific nutrients in the soil. It just tells us what's potentially available. So when you put them together, we really get this, this holistic plant microbe symbiosis of like how everything's moving and grooving together. Um, and, and Lance, I think you were the first one I heard this analogy from, but the, the microbes are kind of like your supply chain workers. You have your nutrients, which are your, your basic commodities, right? That all of the, the, the wood, the building blocks, the brick, the fuel, all of the basic commodities that are, that you need the raw materials, right? Your raw materials. And then you need a, a supply chain, a, a group of workers and to move those nutrients from the warehouse of the soil into, you know, make them available to the plant um, to produce what they're, you know, the plant is producing the raw, the final material, right? Versus the raw material. And then you have the, the plants, you know, assimilating with the, the microbes and the, um, you know, the compensation, like Lance mentioned, of like what comes back. So when the plants are, are built up with all of their raw materials, their phosphorus, potassium, nitrogen, all of their supplied by the microbes, now you have this, you know, big, beautiful plant that's growing and more robust and producing more carbon. And it's putting a lot of that carbon back into the workforce. That's the energy. That's the dollars that are going back into the supply chain to feed the microbes in exchange for those nutrients. So that's like kind of the exchange that's happening in the, the soil supply chain, if you will, going from the raw materials, the workers are our microbes that we need to your final product, and the money that's exchanged going back to continue producing and making available those nutrients. Okay. And if I can, Marie, one step further. So it's one thing when you run, so you run a Haney test or you run a mailing three test or whatever it is, and you, you're evaluating what's in that warehouse, right? You're saying, okay, this is what I've got. This is my soil. I've got this much phosphorus, this much potassium, et cetera. And what really hit home for me, I'll share a real example, is that, so I had somebody a year ago who ran 12 samples for Haney test. They also ran the B crop test and it went over and they said, hey, can you explain this to me? I've got issues with uh, sulfur. You know, my B crop test indicates to me that the sulfur pathways are shut down on these three samples. I didn't have those results. So I look at the Haney test and I said, is it, is it these three samples? I picked the three out and they said, well, yeah, how, how did you know that? Well, those, I didn't know that, I guess, but those were the three samples that had sulfur levels above a hundred parts per million. And we saw the same thing on phosphorus in three other samples, these were, you know, that had phosphorus above 80 parts per million. So what well, what I was seeing was this inverse relationship, right? You've got a you got a warehouse that's full of sulfur and phosphorus, but yet the the workers that are responsible for mobilizing phosphorus are not there. The workers that you know the microbes that are responsible for solubilizing and moving and transporting sulfur are not there. But why? Well, the plant is not going to support those workers and feed those workers if the plant believes it doesn't need them. And when the plant senses that it's in an environment that's got all of this luxury sulfur and phosphorus, guess what? It says, I don't need any help. And so then when the plant really demands phosphorus and sulfur, guess what? It's not adequate to take it out of the soil at a, at a rate high enough. So think of your corn crop, when does it need the majority of its nitrogen? You know, so it's it's just growing vegetatively and it's like, oh, I got plenty here. I can take up what I need. And then all of a sudden the demand goes up in the plant reproduction and it needs that nitrogen. And at that point, the plant comes up short because the microbes aren't there to help it. And that's what really pulled this together to me with that whole, you know, and if you are trying to build a good solid workforce, you want different workers with different skill sets. And that's what the B crop tech technology shows you is where are the gaps in your workforce you have a ton of microbes that can do this that's great or maybe it's not good you know but it's saying yep they do this that's great but we're missing these 
And then now we have an agronomic direction and decision, which kind of leads into how do we address those questions, right? But it's, it's those types of things being pulled together because in conventional agronomy, here's what the answer is. Put more on of whatever it is you're short of, right? And, and, but we've seen direct inverse relationship between putting more on and getting more back out. We all know that you put 18 pounds of phosphorus on to get one pound out. Well, that's not incredibly efficient. And so that's how we are trying to pull this stuff together. The answer is not always more. Yeah, law of minimums and law of maximums to achieve a balancing act there that, that allows you to support that workforce. We, Yeah, so I want to run through these questions really quick. We've only got about 10 minutes left, and we have a ton of questions from the audience. Um, so I'm hoping some of these questions that we're going to talk about will address some of those. Um, but let me run through these really quick, because we've got about 10 minutes left. Um, so first question, agronomic, is like, if you're, if you're exploring the use of biologicals or biostimulants, what product should I use? The Haney Test Insight can kind of give you the microbial nutrient needs, the carbon and nitrogen balance, imbalances or balance, um, and let you know what you have today. And the, bio, the bee crop test is really going to help you understand, like Lance was just mentioning, microbial functions that are lacking and that need supplementing. So this kind of comes full circle. Understand what's there, understand who's there to move it, just like you're talking with the supply chain, and use that information to inform your biological or biostimulant uh products that you're evaluating based on what microbial functions are actually missing in order to move your potentially available nutrients so that's one way how it you know creates a feedback loop maybe another question is what cover crop should i use um you know you may have nitrogen or nutrient use efficiencies or nutrient deficiencies that certain cover crops can help based on the nutrient balance and then you can also understand the microbial ecology and what's going on in order to produce a synergistic effect with the microbes or the nutrients you want available and the microbes that are there to use it or the microbes that you want to feed to circle back to choose a cover crop. Uh, various management practices, increasing soil organic carbon. So understanding where your soil organic carbon is today, um, carbon cycling, respiration, and so on. And then also, you know, in the Haney test, and then you can also look at uh, microbial sequestration and loss potential by understanding who exactly is in the soil and what they're doing. And then the last one, which I think we've, we've talked about a lot, which I think is huge and contributes to a lot of the, the yield management and disease management decisions is, how can I reduce fertilizer applications while maintaining or, in, or increasing yield? So like we've talked about a lot, our nutrients are mobilized by biology. So if we understand what nutrients are potentially there, potentially available based on the Haney test, and then we can couple that with microbial nutrient cycling potential and, and growth hormones and so on, we now can understand what gaps are in my system to maybe then make some of these decisions on biologicals, cover crops, management practices. Um, we can use that information to inform how we increase nutrient use efficiencies while maintaining yield or increasing yield um, by using more of that eight, those 18 pounds of phosphorus to get one pound out. Um, maybe we're increasing that to um, you know, still use 18 pounds of phosphorus, but we're getting, you know, four pounds out. So those are just some of the agronomic questions that come up. Um, but these questions, I think, are going to address some of the questions in the chat as well. So I'm going to run through these really fast so we have some time to get into the audience questions. Um, Region Ag Labs will be conducting the bee crop test at their lab here in the next month. We've been partnering with them so far. So if you send your samples to Regen, or biomakers, the labs collaborate and we can get both tests done so you can get a B crop plus. Um, so that, that's you know what the system we have currently going. Uh, B crop test turnaround time compared to the Haney test. Haney test is two to three days, Lance? Yeah, yeah, two to three days. And then the B crop test, cool. And so their, their chemical fertility test does happen quicker. We It takes longer to de sequence the DNA, um, but we're at about a 11 to 12 day turnaround time for the bee crop test. So you can have your results in under two weeks for both. Uh, doo -doo -doo. Can I also add physical soil test to the biological and chemical test? Lance runs under phys other physical tests at Region Ag Labs and you certainly can add more on to the bee crop plus to get a deeper dive at the physics of the soil and how that influences efficiencies and what's going on. Uh, how do I receive the bee crop results? 
when you send a sample to Regen or to Biomakers, your results will be sent in a PDF and also available on the portal, uh, where you can compare fields side by side and use other analytical tools to look at your biological results. Let's see. Oh, will the B crop turnaround time and price be the same at Regen as Biomakers? Yes. So in either direction, you work with biomakers, you're sending your samples to biomakers or directly to Regen or vice versa, um, the price and the turnaround time is the, the same in, in both locations. And somebody to have a question about price, um, Lance, remind me the B crop test or the Haney test is being ran at 55? Uh, 55, yeah. 55, so Haney by itself is 55, B crop by itself is 199, put them together, 255 to get the whole uh, the whole evaluation together of, of what's going on in the soil biology with the chemistry. And then can you measure the effects of fertilizer applications, biologicals, or other egg inputs? Yes. So we have various trial protocols or management protocols that we can discuss with you. Um, you can connect with Lance or I to dive into that and we can help set up a, a trial to answer the questions that you have around biologicals, management practices, fertilizer applications, and so on. Sorry to run through that really fast. I just wanted to make sure we had time for questions. Um, so now I'll just dive in here and start looking at some of the questions that we have in the chat. Um, one question is, how do we determine the difference between living and dead DNA? Uh, so, we, because we're looking at the soil biology within three to five days of the soil coming out of the, the ecosystem, we look at the biology all the same. We can distinguish between living and dead, but for regular tests, we just look at it all. And that's because the DNA in the soil is consumed so quickly that we can assume that all of the biology that we're looking at within three days of leaving the field was probably alive at the time of sampling. So we're just assuming that most of it was alive, even if there are a few that have died in the, in the shipping process before we get there. Um, we, we do have protocols to differentiate dead DNA if that is a you know a, a, an important objective in product or soil tests. But yeah, typically, much we we consider it more scientifically robust to look at both together. Yeah, the DNA is churning so quickly in the soil, um, and you know that. We're just looking at it all together and can assume that the DNA that we identify it has not been there for a really long time. It just has been there for a couple of days. Um, can you elaborate on sample timing intervals and its importance? So Lance, do you have a recommendation for when the best time to pull a Haney test is? Um, yeah, so for the Haney test, it, it depends on one of two things. Uh, what are you what are you trying to do with it? So what I mean by that is, if you're just trying to evaluate soil health, um, then your best time to pull that sample is generally three to four weeks after your crops or plants are have broken dormancy. So in a pasture system, you know whether break dormancy or in a row crop system, three to four weeks after you know emergence. Um, so that's kind of your optimal times and that and then again on the back end as well before the soils get cold you can do it again in the fall or or choose the fall stay consistent though if you stick with you know if you start with fall stick with fall if you start in the spring stick with spring um but if you're trying to use the haney test to evaluate nutrient recommendations so if you're using it for your part of your fertility management program obviously that coincides with your fertilizer management time so if you're, you know, for people that are doing most of their application in the spring, we want to pull those samples at least two weeks. Um, again, it's two to three day turnaround on those, but you want to get them to the lab, you know, roughly two weeks before you're going to be applying um, fertilizer. Um, for um, fall applicators, again, same thing, you can do it in the fall, but. Yeah, yeah our, our answer is exactly the same. Uh, so it depends on what you're trying to use the testing for. So if you're pulling a B crop plus with B crop plus Haney, um, we typically are doing fall or spring sampling to inform management decisions. Um, and just like Lance said, we would recommend doing it at the same time every year so that you get, you're, you're looking at the changes over time at the same time of year and what's going on in those conditions as well. 
Mm -mm, let's see. There's a lot of questions here. Um, we talked about costs. Uh, we can send out to all the participants like a sampling protocol. It's very standard protocol for Haney and B crop. You can pull them. They, you can use the same methodology where we're just using a standard six inch core um, and composite samples across the management zone, homogenizing it, and then pulling a sample from there. So that's just a little bit about the, the sampling protocol. Someone asked, the Malik 3 was mentioned several times. Um, we just mentioned it because that's a standard, you know, one of the standard chemical fertility analysis that we're comparing the Haney to just for clarity. Uh, uh, the Lance, you can run the Malik 3, but it's different than the Haney, just for clarification for those questions that came up. The, the Malik 3 is just probably the most commonly used universal right. extractant out there. Right. Let's see. Mm -hmm. One of the questions was, if your if your test suggests low yield is caused by the bi soil biology, what kind of suggestions do you have for farmers? So the you know the test goes beyond the B crop test. I assume in this question, the test goes beyond just identifying, uh, mm -hmm. hey, the soil biology is lacking. That's why you're having yield problems, right? The test is actually identifying here's a yield loss or here's a yield drag. Here are your deficiencies. We identified that you had low nitrogen cycling and low zinc cycling, and you also had low stress adaptive hormones and it was a really hot year. So you're able to actually diagnose what biological issues are going on in the soil to then say, oh, that makes sense. That's why I had a yield difference, even though the fertility was the same across the field and I had a 15% yield difference in this field or in this side of the field, was because I have low nitrogen mobilization from the biology and you know whatever other factors are present there. Um, and then you can use that information now to inform your management decisions. So you're, okay, I have low nitrogen cycling. Well, we can, to this year, right? If you find that out in the spring or the fall, this year you can bring in a nitrogen solubilizer, nitrogen mobilization inoculant, a biological product that is designed to help increase nitrogen use efficiencies, we can bring that in this year, right now, right? In our fertility program to address that issue that we've diagnosed in the B crop. And then moving forward, we can think about management practice changes, cover crops uh, to improve nitrogen cycling, you know, reduce tillage, so on. These other management practices that we can then incorporate year after year but in this year today, we can improve nitrogen cycling by bringing in a biological product or an oculant and so on. Unfortunately, um, we are at time. Was there one more thing, Lance, that you were gonna add? Well, I was just gonna say on, on the Haney test side of things, you know, we're not throwing all conventional agronomy out the window. So, you know, we see, for example, like low soil respiration. Okay, well, why? Okay, well then, so we start looking at things like pH, soluble salts, um, those things affect biology. You know, putting on four tons of gypsum every year can create a salty solution. And so the microbes are affected by that. So we look at those things and sometimes it's straight lack of nutrients. I mean, I, I mean, you know, I'm, my message here is not to say, hey, don't put anything on. Um, we had a producer recently who had a soil test phosphorus of less than two parts per million. Phosphorus was a very limiting factor for his biology. Uh, because they need those nutrients too. So putting on some phosphorus in that case actually stimulated the biology, right? Adding lime when your pH is 4.8 will stimulate the biology. So we do look at those things and take them into account too. It's not just cover crops and manure and, you know, compost or biologicals, but those things then, as Marie pointed out, will be built into potentially your management system. I think that's a, a great place to close because it just highlights, Lance, the, the importance of looking at chemistry and biology together. It's not just biology. It's not just chemistry. Those things are deeply interlinked. Your pH affects biology. Your biology also buffers pH. Like there's, they're deeply connected and you can't look at them. We've looked at them separately for a long time. So I think that, yeah, it's a great place to conclude that, you know, emphasizing the importance and the excitement that we have around having a technology and a partnership that can allow us to look at chemistry and biology 
together to best inform management decisions in agriculture. So thanks everybody for being here. We had a ton more questions. We'll um, download them and get back to you in the next couple of days. So we really appreciate your participation and thanks again for joining another Biomakers webinar. Thank you everybody. Thanks. Yeah.